Okay, this is going to be chapter 12 of the cardiovascular system, and this is going to be part one. Uh, topics we're going to cover here, uh, anatomy, with the heartbeat, and essentially heart dynamics is, is the areas that are going to be covered in this section. And first of all, uh, the heart place, the heart's place in the circulatory system, and pretty much it's the pump, uh, very simply. Uh, blood flows through a network of blood vessels. Uh, there's some terms on this page, this one being one of them right here, pulmonary circuit. Uh, circuit of vessels that oxygenate and carries blood to exchange surfaces of the lungs. Now, the pulmonary circuit is essentially after the right heart, and whenever I get a uh, picture here, I'm going to talk through all of these terms that we just, that we just went over. Um, the next term is systemic circuit, transport blood to and from the rest of the body. So this is going to be outside of the pulmonary circuit or outside of the actual lungs. Arteries, efferent vessels carry blood away from the heart. And veins or afferent vessels uh, return blood to the heart. Now, this is why we actually have um, pulmonary arteries on deoxygenated blood side and then pulmonary veins on the oxygenated side and we'll explain that whenever we actually hit hit a picture to where we can differentiate them. Uh, capillaries are small thin walled vessels between the smallest arteries and veins and these are about they have a lumen about the size of one red blood cell diameter so Capillaries are very, very tiny. Uh, right atrium uh, receives blood from the systemic circuit. And this is going to be, every time that we hear systemic, we should think body. And right ventricle discharges blood into the pulmonary circuit. Now, what the right ventricle's job is, is to load the pulmonary trunk or load the lungs so that the blood can get oxygenated. Left atrium collects blood from the pulmonary circuit or the pulmonary trunk and this is going to be after it's been oxygenated and then we have a left ventricle which ejects the blood into the systemic circuit now here is a very well we're going to see some more pictures but this is a very simple one so we essentially if you start thinking about this now we essentially have two hearts we have a right heart and a left heart now the reason I like to look at it like this is because the right hearts job is to pretty much get the blood from the venous side and get it into the lungs so that it can be oxygenated. The left heart's job is to take the blood from the lungs and then pump it out to the body in the systemic circuit. So, systemic trunk are going to be essentially your head and your brain and the rest of the body. Systemic veins, now all of these are going to drain into the right atrium. Now this is the right heart again. Let's go ahead and clear this. I'll back up one. Okay, so the right heart's job is to pump blood into the lungs to be oxygenated. And this is where I come up with the term pulmonary trunk. Uh, once it gets into the lungs, it's oxygenated and then returns into the left heart. So we have essentially two circuits that we're concerned with. We are concerned with the systemic circuit, which I'm going to draw now. And, okay, so whenever it comes out of the left side of the heart, it goes to the tissues, whether that be the head or body, and that's considered the systemic circuit. Now, this is considered the pulmonary circuit, which is off of the right, and essentially
Now, what the pulmonary circuit does is it takes the deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart and pumps it into the lungs to get oxygenated. And from there, the left heart picks it up and pumps it to the systemic circuit. So you have two circuits. You're going to need to know both of these, pulmonary circuit and a systemic circuit. The anatomy and organization of the heart. <clears throat> We're going to talk about surface anatomy, heart walls, tagus disease, as far as a clinical note. Internal anatomy and organization, mitral valve prolapse, another clinical note, valvular disease, another clinical note, blood supply to the heart, and then coronary artery disease. So anatomy and organization of the heart. We have something called a pericardial cavity, and there's going to be a picture here in about two more slides. I'm going to go through these terms, and then we'll take a look at the picture. Pericardial cavity, cavity surrounding the heart. We have also a pericardium lining of the pericardial cavity that is a serous membrane and this means that it it has serum and plasma it's viscous it has uh, fluid inside of it the base of the heart now most people would think that this is reverse but the base of the heart is actually at the top of the heart where all of those vessels come out at and then we have something called the visceral pericardium epicardium covers the outer surface of the heart and if we'll just remember as we see these, this is going to touch an organ. Okay, so this is going to be on the outer surface of the heart. And then we have the epicardium, visceral, visceral pericardium, so those are pretty much synonymous. And then we have the parietal pericardium, lines the inner surface of the pericardial sac which surrounds the heart. So this is going to be the part touching other organs. Surface anatomy, we have an auricle. An auricle is pretty much a deflated atria. Outer atria, when deflated, is called an auricle. Coronary sulcus, and these are grooves that are actually in the heart. A deep groove, usually filled with a substantial amount of fat, and this is in case it needs an extra energy source. Um, anterior interventricular sulcus, a shallower depression marking the left and the right ventricles. Posterior interventricular sulcus, shallower depression marking the left and right ventricles. So the anterior is on the front side and the posterior is on the back side. Apex, which is pretty much the bottom of the heart. Now I'm going to draw a little heart over here just to show you. We talked about a couple terms. The base is actually up here, and the apex is down below. So just a position, the thyroid gland is at the cricothyroid membrane right below your Adam's apple. We have the trachea, first rib, which is right there, left lung and right lung. And then this is essentially the base of the heart. And this being the top point is the apex. The parietal pericardium is going to be touching other organs and if we'll take a note here do you see how the diaphragm is very very close to the heart so the best place to actually do a pericardial synthesis is going to be probably from the xiphoid process 45 degree angle aiming towards the shoulder all right so this is a better picture over here inner wall and this would be the actual heart this hand so the inner wall where it's touching the organ is considered the visceral pericardium. The airspace corresponds to the pericardial cavity. And the outer wall corresponds to the parietal pericardium. So this is what's going to be touching other organs. And this is a pericardial cavity. Since this is moving continuously, it's fluid filled and gives it a little bit of protection. All right, the heart wall. We have the epicardium, covers the outer surface of the heart. And this is from outside to inside. Epicardium covers the outer surface of the heart. The myocardium, which is the muscular wall of the heart, and the endocardium, which heart's inner surface, including the heart valves, are considered the endocardium. So... These will all have to be known, too, because you're going to have to play Mr. Blood Cell. What Mr. Blood Cell is, is you eject one red blood cell out. You're going to need to know all the vessels on its journey. Uh, 
until it comes back in the heart. Um, so, you have the superior vena cava, which is the large vessel here, the right atrium, and remember the right side, of, the right side of the heart is to pump blood into the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary circuit. Um, this is considered an auricle when it's deflated. Uh, we have the right ventricle here and the left ventricle here. This is the auricle of the left atria. This is the left pulmonary artery, and this would be the right one back behind here the left and the right pulmonary artery. And we essentially have a vessel that's attached in this right ventricle. So when the right ventricle ejects blood, it ejects blood into the pulmonary trunk. Now, if we'll take note, this is the posterior side of the heart, or the back. And after the blood is oxygenated in the lungs, it comes back in to the pulmonary veins. And this is where we're going to get that efferent, afferent. This is deoxygenated blood, but this is still considered it is in the pulmonary artery because it's going away from the heart. And the left, this right here, where the left pulmonary veins and the right pulmonary veins are, these are heading back towards the heart. So that's why even though they have oxygenated blood in them, they're considered pulmonary veins. They come into the left ventricle, get put, or left atrium, get put into the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle, I'm gonna make this less busy here. The left ventricle ejects the blood into the aorta, which this now goes into the systemic circuit until it returns into the superior and inferior vena cava and starts all over again. Cardiac muscle cells, they have something special on them called an intercalated disc. Each cardiac cell is in contact with a specialized site known as an intercalated disc. This allows action potentials to travel from cell to cell. And why that is special is because we want entire regions of the heart cells to contract at once. So. What happens is, is these kind of work like, uh, like a sheathed or myelinated surface in the nerve cells. So whenever the action potential excites this spot here, instead of having to travel through all of this tissue, what it does is it kind of pond skips. It'll jump from intercalated disc to intercalated disc, and this increases the speed of the electrical signaling that's occurring in your in your myocardial tissue. Connective tissue. Connective tissue to the heart is a large amount of elastic fibers that wrap around each other and tie together adjacent cells. And they do this because they provide support, they add strength, and they help the heart return to its normal shape after contraction. And we have connective tissue that is embedded in between the actual myocardium, this is myocardial tissue, and these right here, let me erase this here, are the intercalated discs. And how this works is, is when this is contracting or it's giving the electrical stimulus, it'll jump to those intercalated discs and all it does, all that action potential does, or that electricity does, is shorten that cell. So the cell gets smaller. If it's filled with fluid at that point, it contracts. This is a side view of the intercalated discs. Uh, from the inside out, we have endocardium, myocardium, and then pericardium. This is figure 12.4 in your book. Chagas disease. Uh, Central South America heart disease is sometimes due to a parasite infection from Trypanosoma cruzi uh, spread through a bite known as the kissing bug. 
And the reason we bring this up is because it essentially gives us this. Um, initial symptoms are mild, later the heart enlarges. The heart only has a certain amount of real estate. So if your heart gets big in its, in its location, it becomes its own worst enemy. Uh, you lose something called ejection fraction, and what that means is is that you go into a pump failure. Uh, initial symptoms are mild, and the heart enlarges and causes dysrhythmia, and the patient dies from heart failure. And we essentially, they die from two different things, inflammation of the myocardium, and then disease of the myocardium. So both of these myocarditis causes a loose floppy heart the heart's inflamed it can't really contract like it's supposed to and then the cardiomyopathy does pretty much the same thing it puts the pump into failure you have an inefficient pump internal anatomy and organization interatrial septum and if we'll just pay attention to what these words are enter inside the atrial septum and this separates pretty much the atria. So whenever we're looking at the heart, that would be this right here, interatrial septum. Interventricular septum separates the ventricles, and that's going to be this. Atrioventricular valve, atria opens into the ventricles through this valve, and we have two different types. Now, this is going to be the right side of the heart and the left side. So on the right side, we have three cusps or a tricuspid valve. On the left side, we have two cusps or a bicuspid valve. So a way to remember this is the tricuspid is always right. <clears throat> Superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Now, both of these dump into the right atrium. Pulmonic semilunar valves guards the pulmonary trunk, and this is a pressure-sensitive valve, and the reason they call it semilunar is because it's in the shape of two half-moons, so as blood is being squeezed from the ventricle and pushing on this valve, it works as a flap. Now, what will occur is, is this flap will pop open whenever pressure gets high enough and release the blood into the pulmonary trunk. You have one on the aortic side as well, and this one's a special one. This one here, it's very important to understand how it functions. Um, the aortic semilunar valve works the same way. The valve is in the shape of two half moons. Only difference is, is on the aortic semilunar valve side, your coronary artery openings are right at the base of that valve. Now, why that's important? When blood's ejected, the ventricle has a lot of high pressure, so those flaps come up and they protect the coronary artery openings from high pressure. At the point that they snap shut or they close again, the afterload pressure or the pressure that's in the arteries comes back and perfuses the coronary arteries in the heart. Now, why this is important. If your heart is running 150 times per minute, there is no way you're getting adequate coronary artery perfusion. Now, that's why you can pretty much have chest pain from nothing more than a heart rate alone. So if your patient exhibits a heart rate of 150, 160 beats per minute, and they're having cardiac symptoms, it's because that semilunar valve is opening and closing way too fast. And this is Mr. Blood Cell. This is probably going to be in the form of <clears throat> a, an essay that is in your actual blackboard. So heart lung circulation, you need to know this. Vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid's always right, right ventricle, pulmonic. This would be the pulmonic semilunar valve, pulmonary arteries pulmonary arterioles, pulmonary capillaries, lungs and gas exchange occurs, pulmonary venules, pulmonary veins, left atrium, this is now oxygenated blood, mitral valve, which is also called the bicuspid, left ventricle, aortic semilunar valve, aorta, coronary arteries simultaneously, and the rest of the body. In the rest of the body, it is arteries, 
arterioles. Capillaries. After the capillaries, we start on the venous side. Venules, which are small veins. Then veins. And then back here again to the superior and inferior vena cava, and we start this process all over again. You're going to need to know Mr. Blood Cell. Internal anatomy and organization. Uh, Chordae corda, tendinae on the heart valves, uh, and these are pretty much each cusp is anchored by these tendons. And then we have something called papillary muscles. And these are attached to the chordae tendinae, and they limit the movement of the cusp and prevent backflow of blood into the right atrium. So what this allows is as soon as the pressure builds in the ventricles from the ventricles contracting, it collapses these papillary muscles and secures our AV valves. And we'll kind of show you that here in just a second. And this is figure 12.5. This is where the deoxygenated blood comes in. The right atria, we have passive filling occurring. Now you get about 70% of your cardiac output from everything below this line. And that would mean that both of your ventricles working simultaneously. You get 30% of your cardiac output from your atria. So all of this passively fills, even the ventricles start filling for a while. This is the, the cusps of those AV valves right here. And these are, let's see, if we'll take a look on this side, these are those on this side, which are the chordae tendinae. Now what these do is as the blood, and I'm going to clean this up here a little bit now that you know what I'm, you're looking for. As the blood comes into the atria are contracting in the directions of those two arrows. At the point that the electrical stimulus, starting from the SA node to the AV node, the atria are going to contract and superfill the ventricles or kind of stretch this environment a little bit. The electrical stimulus will now go to the AV node down through the septum and the retrograde contraction or the retrograde stimulus doesn't occur until it reaches the apex of the heart. So now this transmits the electrical stimulus into this myocardial tissue and the ventricles contract in this direction. Now what happens is, is after they fill and stretch a little bit and now they start to contract, these papillary muscles collapse these AV valves so that the only two openings, and I'm going to clean this up so we can see what I'm talking about here, so that the only two openings are going to be into the pulmonary artery and out of the aorta. Now remember here and underneath here, is where the aortic semilunar valves are. <clears throat> now, why these are important. The aortic semilunar valve pretty much houses or protects the coronary artery openings whenever the flaps are open. Whenever the flaps are shut, the arterial pressure that's in the aorta allows for perfusion of the coronary arteries. Structural differences between the left and right ventricles. Uh, left heart is bigger, takes about six to seven times more force to pump the blood to the body than it does into the pulmonary circuit. So this is going to be a bigger muscle, and I'll, I'll make note of this here. I'm going to erase this so that you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> does everyone see the thickness difference between the right and the left muscle? And there's a huge difference. The left myocardium is, is much more beefy and much more muscular. Uh, right heart returns blood from the venous side and preloads the pulmonary trunk. Now, this is something that we've already been talking about. The right heart loads the pulmonary trunk. The left heart can work without the right heart. 
but you're going to have low cardiac outputs. Now, what this means is, is I'm going to blank the screen here really quick. That whenever we're talking about pressure, now this is right and left, and this hole up here is our superior vena cava. This is our pulmonary artery. And this one, we're going to make a curve on because this is our aorta. Now, whenever we talk about pressure, low pressure side, and we can do without, I said in this, we could do without the right heart. And that's absolutely correct. As the back pressure and the left ventricle, due to its size, is much more larger than the right ventricle. Whenever this thing is squeezing and sucking blood into it, it can actually suck blood from the left atrium, from the lungs, from the actual right ventricle, and from the right atria, even from the venous side. Now, here's the trick. The reduction of cardiac output is severe. Your ejection fraction should be upwards of 70 to 80 percent. A person with an absolute total right-sided MI or right-sided failure to where the left ventricle is having to work or increases workload may have an ejection fraction equal to or just a little bit probably equal to about 15 percent versus 70 to 80 now what this is going to do is this is going to make them short of breath and weak all the time. Um, normal patient that has a small MI, he can respond from that quite quickly and go into some rehab and change his diet a little bit and everything is fine. The person with 15% ejection fraction will be on home oxygen and will get short of breath just by turning over in bed. The heart valves, AV valves, regurgitation of blood back through the AV valves causes a murmur. So whenever you hear somebody saying they have a murmur, this is from the AV valves regurgitating. You kind of hear a swishing sound instead of a nice crisp um, snap is what you should actually hear. And this is from a top view. If everyone will take a look at this here. This is, they slice the heart in half and remove the top. Now, this is looking down into the right and the left ventricle. This is the patient's front or his anterior. This is the patient's posterior. This is the right and the left. So, <clears throat> these are the semilunar valves and these flaps, the coronary artery openings, are like right here. So aortic semilunar valve, these two flaps protect the coronary artery openings. Now whenever the atria contract, which have been removed, it will shoot blood into these two areas here. Now at the point, this is from the left atrium into the ventricle. At the point that the ventricle starts to contract in this direction, it will collapse those two valves and then apply pressure to the semilunar valve and enough to where it will open it up and eject it. Uh, clinical notes, mitral valve prolapse. <clears throat> About 10% of the people may have a mitral valve prolapse. Uh, 14 to 30 of those in this study uh, have may have, about 14 out of 30 may have a mitral valve prolapse, more than you would think. And about 10% of those are from the actual shape. I'll get this right here in a second. Abnormal, long, or short, chordae tendinae, and this is what would actually... Um, provide structural support <coughs> to the to the actual AV valves or malfunction of the papillary muscles um, can actually cause a mitral valve prolapse. Now most of these are 
without any symptom or asymptomatic whatsoever. A little bit of regurgitation doesn't hurt you. It's whenever you're getting a lot of regurgitation into the previous chamber that they can become problematic. <clears throat> Clinical notes, valvular disease. Rheumatic fever can cause the immune system to make antibodies against the leaflets of the valves. Now, this is going to be a bad thing. Um, the rheumatic fever likes those valves, so it goes in and it sets up shop in there, and then essentially what happens is, is the body's, make, the body's immune system attacks it. And whenever that happens, that destroys the actual valves. Now, this can get more than just a little bit of regurgitation whenever this occurs. Uh, causes vegetative growth, causes the heart valves to close improperly. So every time the ventricle's pressure would increase, you would get regurgitation in the previous chamber. Uh, blood supply to the heart. Uh, coronary circulation uh, supplies blood to the muscle tissue of the heart. Coronary arteries originate at the base of the aorta, and this is what we were talking about just a second ago, at the aortic sinuses. <clears throat> An anastomosis, which I need to explain here once we get through talking about this a little bit, are small collateral vessels that branch uh, into various locations. Um, middle cardiac veins uh, carry blood away from the coronary capillaries and coronary sinus. Coronary capillaries drain into the coronary sinus. Large, thin, walled vein in the posterior portion of the coronary sulcus. And then last term here on this page, and then I need to explain anastomosis a little bit. Uh, coronary or myocardial infarction and coronary circulation becomes blocked. The cardiac muscle cells die due to lack of oxygen. Now I'm going to blank this page and we're going to talk about an anastomosis and kind of what that is. Okay, so let's say that I am 60 years old and I've had multiple heart attacks. Sinoatrial, atrioventric node, the bundle branches. So that's the conduction system and essentially our heart. But let's say that I've infarcted tissue here and here. And my heart has lived with these infarctions or this dead tissue in these areas for all of these years. Now, in the big scheme of things, and I'm going to draw the vessels, this is the aortic semilunar valve. This is the left coronary artery reopening and the right coronary artery opening. This is the right coronary artery. This is the left main, the left anterior descending, and something called the circumflex. Now, this is the general piping of most people. But if you've had this pathology or this disease process, that doesn't mean that you can't start to create new anastomoses. So a person that's had multiple heart attacks is going to create collateral circulation or new areas of blood supply due to occlusion or due to dead tissue. Now what this is going to cause is, is that the person that's had several MIs can probably take another one. Now let's talk about Lance Armstrong for a second. And looking at Lance Armstrong, do you think he's had multiple heart attacks? And the answer is, is no, he hasn't. He's healthy. If you look at Lance Armstrong's coronary artery distribution, it would look exactly like the pictures drawn out of the AMP books. Now the question is simply this. Can Lance Armstrong take a heart attack? And the answer is, is who's, who's going to die first here? The 60 year old? If he's having an LED occlusion or a heart attack? Or is Lance Armstrong? Who's going to die? And the answer is Lance Armstrong. The reason, you ever heard the analogy, only the good die young? 
Lance has not created any anastomoses in his coronary artery circulation. So if he has an MI, he has no collateral circulation that he can perfuse that tissue with. That section of myocardium will die, he will go into full arrest, and things will be bad. Bob over here that's had multiple MIs has created so many new pathways that it looks like LA freeway system running through his coronary arteries. So he has tons of collateral circulation and anastomosis is created from the multiple MIs he's had. All right, so an anastomosis, collateral vessels that branch off. Coronary arteries, you essentially have two openings off of the aorta. One of them is called the right coronary artery and the other one is called the left coronary artery. Very simply, the right coronary artery feeds about 90% of the right side of the heart and about 10% of the left. And this is because it kind of loops around the back of it. The left coronary artery feeds about 90% of the left side and about 10% of the right. So both of them over overlap in an area called the inferior wall. So let's look at these. This is the aorta. This is the right coronary artery opening. This is the left coronary artery opening. This is what I was calling the left vein earlier. This is the LED. And this is the circumflex. Now this goes around, this is the anterior view or the front view. This circumflex comes on around and it feeds all of this down here. Now looking over here to the right, this is the right coronary artery. It kind of runs diagonally and it hooks around the back. comes around in this area and hooks here. So again, the right coronary artery feeds about 90% of the right side of the heart and about 10% of the left in this collateral circulation area. This zone right here is fed both by the left and the right coronary arteries. So this is our miraculous 10% that is shared by both arteries. Clinical notes, coronary artery disease. ACS is pretty much called acute coronary syndrome. Uh, reperfusion restores blood flow to the heart brain through medications or surgery. And then revascularization. Now we used to use things like TPA and clot busters to actually reperfuse the areas by busting the clot. Now, instead of that, we have a cath lab, and the cath lab does something called revascularization, and it does it through PTCA, percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. Now, what this does is this essentially the vessel of those coronary arteries <clears throat> has decreased its lumen, so they introduce something called a stent and a stent does nothing more than open up the vessel and it does this by putting a wire mesh device and the actual lumen of the vessel that adheres to the vessel size. It's kind of, it looks kind of like a Chinese finger trap. You push on the ends of it and it gets bigger in the middle. A stent does the same thing. So that's what a PTCA is. A cabbage is something different. A cabbage is, is a coronary artery bypass graft. And what a cabbage does is it essentially repipes the areas that are occluded from uh, atherosclerotic plaques. So as far as cabbages are concerned, coronary artery bypass graft, and if we have an occlusion here in the vessel, we're essentially just going to repipe and do a bypass or do a bypass graft. 
So whenever we get an area of infarction occurring, that's here, it's generally transmural, which means full thickness. So if we're looking at this from a 12 leads perspective, we're going to see these cells uh, very, very, very prominently. This is something called a thallium study. And what a thallium study does is it introduces a radiographic dye that they look at as it perfuses the sections of myocardium. So they can tell if you have areas that are not perfused well and maybe set the person up for another stress test um, or a diagnostic angiogram. The angiogram would go in there and show them the actual vessels, which is, this is an infarction zone, and this is also to show you, and we're going to talk about this in basic EKG and 12 lead, but we do get ST changes depending on what type of injury we have. This is an angiogram. So they introduce dye. The dye goes down here, and right here we can see that there's an occlusion. And why we see there's an occlusion is because all of a sudden there is no, um, the vessel just stops abruptly, or it appears to be a gap. Now, the only reason that we're seeing before and after here is this person does have an anastomosis, and the anastomosis is allowing for collateral circulation. This catheter here is threaded through and the blockage is essentially cleared and then they put a stent in and the stent is essentially um, a Chinese finger trap. You push the ends together and the lumen gets bigger. And this will get maybe a, a better look at it. As they introduce this They'll clean out the atherosclerotic plaque. This would be what is giving us the heart attack to begin with, narrowed artery. Um, they will balloon it, which means it will stretch it out, and then they place a stent in there, and the stent doesn't allow for the artery to collapse again, so it keeps it rigid and open. If we do not reperfuse the sections of myocardium, the anaerobic tissue that is in the vessels will give us this. And what this is is simply very large sections of myocardium now think that they are going to take over as the primary pacemaker site. This is too many chefs in one kitchen. This concludes part one. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My name is Roy Smith, 405-219-7613, or I can be reached at smithr.msa.net. Thanks.